Tamir Rice playing with a gun outside a rec center. But he keeps pulling it in and out of his pants and pointing it at people. And I fired two shots. It turned out to be fake and he was shot to death by a rookie police officer who says that he thought it was real. This video contains the interrogation of Timothy Lohman, the primary officer involved in the Tamir Rice case. On November 22, 2014, Cleveland police received a call describing a possibly armed person pointing a gun at passersby. When the dispatcher passed this message on, she left out the critical information that it was most likely a child with a toy. Officers Timothy Lohman and his partner, Frank Garnback, responded to the call. When they arrived at the park, they found Tamir Rice sitting at a table. When the boy saw the police car, he put what appeared to be a weapon in the waistband of his pants. Before the car had even rolled to a complete stop, Lohman was opening his door and yelling for Rice to put his hands up. When Rice did not comply, Lohman left the vehicle and fired his weapon twice, with one shot striking Rice in the torso. <coughs> All right, <coughs> I'm Detective Diaz from the Cleveland Police Homicide Unit, and we are here uh, for the interview of uh, Officer Timothy Lohman. Uh, Officer Lohman, you are being ordered to this interview pursuant to the orders of the Chief of Police and to the established principles of Garrity v. New Jersey. Uh, time now is 1.19 p.m. Um, what we're going to ask from you is that you just give us an accurate account of the events that occurred on Saturday, November 26th, 2014 at 1910 West Boulevard, which is Cadell Rec. Um, before we get started, if we could just introduce ourselves. Uh, Steve Kynas, K-I-N-A-S, Vice President for the CPPA. Timothy Lohman, Patrolman for Cleveland Police, last name L-O-E-H-M-A-N-N. -N. Badge. 1231 is my badge. Henry Hilo, H-I-L-O-W, Attorney for CPPA. Rob Tucker, you know, I'm sorry. Rob Tucker, Internal Affairs. Okay, if we could just start on from uh, Saturday, November 22nd, uh, what time you started work, who you were assigned with, we go from there. I was assigned to zone car 1 Adam 25 with police officer Frank Garnback. His badge number is 1582. Roll call took place at 1430. Okay. Just go from there. Okay. Well, uh, first off, let's just go real quick. Uh, your partner was Frank Garnback, badge 1582. Uh, he was your training officer that day? Yes, he is my uh, field training officer. All right, when did you, uh, when did you get graduate from the academy? I graduated um, August 28th of this year. Of this year, 14? Mm -hmm. So you've been on the streets just over a month? Okay. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. I served time in the 4th District in my one-man training phase about a little over a month, and then I've been in the 1st District on my two-man phase for about six weeks now. Six weeks, okay. All right, uh, so on Saturday you reported a roll call, and you're assigned with the car with um, Officer Garmeck. Um, what happened from there? Um, right uh, immediately out of uh, roll call, we do our usual uh, vehicle and equipment checks, and uh, we had a call, uh, our first call was uh, to an alarm at uh, San Ignatius Church. Okay. Um, uh, we tended to that matter and uh, we heard over the radio that uh, they were in need of a car at Cadell Rec Center for a male uh, with a gun um, pointing at, you know, passerbys. Um, so we answered that call and said we would uh, be in route. Um, and what type of assignment is that? Code one. It's a code one. Yes, it is a code one. Um, while en route, um, Frank, you know, being my field training officer, said, you know, um, knowing that this is a call uh, with a male with a gun, um, you know, what do you do? And, uh, you know, I said, we're going to be at, at like an elevated level. You know, we're going to be very cautious uh, of what we do. You know, our approach is going to be different uh, because, you know, it, it, it could put us in harm. So Frank said, very good. Uh, he's like, now we're going to be prepared. Take, please, you know, take your weapon out, you know, just in case, because we could come under fire at any time. Okay. Now, uh, over radio, we also got a description of the male. Um, it was a black male with a camouflage hat, wearing a uh, gray sweatshirt with the uh, black sleeves. Uh, so while en route, um, 
Frank uh, decided to uh, go from um, the south end of the park, uh, I believe, which is uh, Madison, and there's a fire station right there at West 100th, okay. and we entered through the uh, sidewalk, like back area of the, uh, uh, near the fire station over there, and went on the grass. So that would be off West 100th Street? Yes. Okay. Which is, it dead ends. It dead ends, and it, you know, you, you, if you slip through, like, uh, go to the side on the sidewalk, you can enter, like, the grass area of the park. When you get the assignment for the code one assignment, do you guys go lights and sirens? Um, we did at times, you know, depending on traffic. I, I believe we, we, we did turn sirens on and then we turned them off, to, depending on the flow of traffic. Um, I believe, yeah, it, like I said, it was on and off, I would okay. believe. That's how, that, and that's how we usually run, depending on the call, the nature of the call, and, you, you know, the flow of traffic. Correct. You know, the, the, you know we kind of judge the necessity of having it, uh, lights and sirens on. Okay. So you get to 100th Street where the street dead ends to the park and you said you go up on the curb, what happens then or the sidewalk? Um, okay, so you know, you, you're entering the park, the grassy area, and immediately you see a male sitting uh, underneath a gazebo by himself um, just at a picnic table. Uh, as we, you know, are getting closer, you can, um, it matched, the male matched the exact description that radio gave us, the camouflage hat, the gray sweatshirt with black sleeves, you know, and it was a black male. And the male, you know, was sitting there, and then he turns around and notices our zone car, you know, approaching him. The male immediately stands up, and he grabs a gun off the table and shoves it in his waistband. Okay, but how far do you think you are away from him at that point? I would say... 30 yards maybe, I would say about, I, I'm not 100% sure, um, I would say about at least 30 yards, and... Is your lights on at this point, or did you turn them off, uh, if you remember? I cannot remember, I would assume they would be off, but I can't, I can't 100% tell you. Okay. Could I ask a question? Sure. Do you, as a driver officer, do you control the lights and sirens? I do not, I do not. Um, at the time, my gun was in my hand and I was focused on the uh, suspect, and then Frank was, you know, he was the driver, so he was, you know, controlling the car and, you know, making sure, and there's a lot of uh, snow and leaves, you know, so Frank had to really, you know, control the car and watch what he was doing, so. Um, All right, so you're about 30 yards away, you see the kid get up, you see him grab a gun from the table? Yes. And what and happened? Sh he shoves it in his waistband, in the front. Um, then, immediately upon that, you know, I, I, at that point I knew he had a gun, so I opened the door slightly ajar and I had presented my weapon and I started screaming verbal commands, put your hands in the air, put your hands in the air, let me see your hands, freeze, put your hands in the air. I said numerous times out loud and I presented my gun. There's some question why, if he could see the weapon, Loman couldn't tell that Rice was a child. I wanted to remind you once again, my new merch shop is up. StrangerLabel.com is full of relatable designs like the unstable and the mentally checked out t-shirts, as well as other cool items like the all-seeing beanie and the stranger socks. Every purchase helps support this channel, and you can even write me a short message on the purchase page. I'll be reading every single message that comes with any order, big or small. So head to StrangerLabel.com and get whatever you want. And with that said, let's get back into the case. You know, through the window, so, you know. Is your he, window down? It, it was closed, I believe, not 100%. I believe it was closed. Okay. But I had the door slightly ajar open, and I was, you know, making sure my gun could be seen by uh, the male. So he knew that, you know, this was not a joke, that we were serious, you know. Mm -hmm. And as we approached... Uh, closer, the male began to walk away, and it, it, it appeared like he was going to take off running. Okay. Um, the male then. Uh, did your partner say anything to you when you guys observed that? He, he did not. He did not say anything because I, I was screaming the verbal commands: "Put your hands up! Let me see your hands! Freeze!" Uh, my partner didn't say anything. He was uh, focused on controlling <laughs> the car. Like I said, it, it was uh, snow and grass and leaves, so he he was maneuvering the car. 
And, um, you know, as we got closer, the male turned around and that's when my partner attempted to stop. But I, I, I believe we did slide. Uh, I, 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 uh, there were like roots in the grass, I believe, you know, from us trying to stop. Mm -hmm. So when we finally uh, like slowed down enough, I opened, pushed the door open and had my gun uh, presented in one, my right hand like this. And I was still screaming verbal commands, let me see your hands, freeze, you know, you know, freeze, put your hands up, let me see your hands. And the, the subject, you know, like I said, be, like as we were coming almost to a complete stop, the subject was already facing our zone car. So he turns to you. He, he turns Sorry. to us as, I'm, like we're almost at a stop, I would say, a near stop. And as, as he's turning, he looks at me, he lifts up his shirt, and he takes his other hand and reaches down and like pulls up, begins to pull up a weapon, a black gun. Now, at this time, I'm pushing the door open and trying to exit the vehicle. Now, the vehicle could have still been moving at a very slow speed because I, I believe we were sliding a little bit because of the debris. And the subject, you know, had the gun like, like so, like, you know, in, in like the abdomen area almost raised. And I fired two shots and then I uh, attempted to take cover and move. And in the process of taking cover, I uh, believe I uh, twist my ankle and slipped and fell. And I was on the ground, but when I uh, returned uh, upward, you know, I was leaning on the cruiser because my leg hurt. I was at the back of the cruiser's rear end, but I couldn't stand because I had injured my ankle. And then my partner, I, and what I see when I stand back up is the black male was down. My partner had his gun drawn and he was shouting verbal commands, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. Now the male wasn't complying right away with his hands, he was still moving them. Where uh, was he at at this point? He was on the ground, laying on the ground, on the uh, cement portion of the gazebo, by, you know, in the picnic t table area. And, you know, once I got up I began, you know, yelling commands again, let me see your hands, because like I said he was still moving his hands. And then once the, you know, the uh, male decided to, you know, stop moving, my partner approached and kicked um, what looked like a uh, 1911 uh, model pistol, a handgun, black handgun. And uh, then I, then we um, approached and uh, observed um, the male. He pulled up his shirt, you know, to show that the gun was removed, like he didn't say anything, he was just pulling up his shirt and it also exposed the wound to the upper abdomen and uh, in, I'm not sure the aura of the sequence but my partner did render aid um, and I was uh, observing the scene 360 for other threats um, and then I also uh, I, like I said, I don't know the order if Frank rendered aid first or, but uh, the other part was um, from the recreation center, um, a female, black female came out running, screaming, saying, you shot my brother, you shot my brother. And at that time we approached her and, uh, you know, wrapped her up so she couldn't get near the scene or the body. Um, <coughs> um, and... When you uh, say wrapped her up. Like, like, like just put our arms around her so she couldn't, you know, get any closer. Uh, Rice's sister was only 13. There was no reason to use force, but she was pushed to the ground and cuffed. Um, and then an off-duty uh, police officer, I believe his name was Cunningham, uh, assisted us. Uh, he came out of the rec I believe. Uh, yeah, he was working in secondary employment there. And he uh, assisted me in uh, cuffing the black female. Do you recall if you cuffed her or he did? It was my pair of cuffs. I want to say that he did, but, and, and then, like I said, the aura of sequence, then detectives came, and I believe they were with the FBI. I, I recognized their faces from a bank robbery the day before on Warren, but I don't know their names, I'm not familiar with them. But they were one of the first uh, to assist, and 
he um we placed in the back of our zone car. Who, who's that? Um, one M two five. I I, I want to say the detention. You mean you placed the female. The the black female yeah. on the zone car. Okay. And then you know she continued to scream, and Frank went back once she you know that was taking a Frank was rendering aid, and one of the detectives, who I believe stated he was a former medic possibly. I, I'm not 100 percent sure. He also helped render aid, like he put gloves on, you know, um, and they were tending to the male. And then the female was yelling, she can't breathe, she can't breathe. So I went to the zone car and rolled down the back window for her so she can, you know, breathe. And, I, you know, we said, calm down, please calm down, you know. And one of the detectives was assisting me. He was telling me to sit down and calm down because I injured my ankle and I, I could barely stand. Um... And at that point, like Frank, you know, kept calling, uh, making calls over the radio, saying, you know, uh, you know, EMS, hurry up, you know, we need EMS. Um, I believe the first medical unit to arrive was the fire department, and uh, they tended to the kid, and then um, EMS came and uh, treated him, and other officers began taping off the air. Now, um, once. Um, once we actually like were able to like slow down and observe what happened, um, then we did realize that it was uh, a juvenile. We were not sure of his age, but at that point um, we could uh, we could notice that it was a juvenile, and then also um, the magazine of the 1911 looking model weapon. Um, you could the magazine fell out of it when Frank kicked it, and you could tell there was no. Um, it was not uh, bullets in it. it, it was like a BB type weapon. All right. You guys are obviously in a marked police car, correct? Yes, we are. All right. And how were you dressed that day? I was dressed uh, in my uh, usual uniform, uh, you know, my uh, navy blue slack shirt. Uh, I wear a tie. Um, CPD I, patches. I had CPD patches. patches, my badge. Um, you know, I have I keep a run sheet in my, uh, you know, uh, between my buttons and my shirt. I have my um, duty rig on with uh, um, handcuffs, uh, my uh, duty weapon with uh, my Glock Mile 17. Um, I have another pair of cuffs and my ass baton. I have my flashlight, my radio, my taser, my uh, OC spray, and then. Uh, two uh, set of spare uh, magazines in the front. Okay. Do you have a secondary weapon? I do not carry a secondary weapon. Okay. All right, when you did fire your weapon, you said you fired how many times? I fired twice. Fired twice and then um, as a, per our training, um, sh we're not supposed to uh, stand still, we're supposed to move. So fired twice and then, you know, tried to get some kind of cover, which I tried to behind the cruiser, uh, you know, as a like a almost like a point of retreat, which we, we're also trained like retreating areas, like using the cruiser as you know some type of concealment or cover. But like I said, in doing so, I uh, uh, injured my ankle and I, you know was, I was on the ground and you know I, it was hard for me to stand when I you know. Uh, came back up and uh, you know also we were taught in the academy you know it said that you know your cruiser is your coffin so you know my my uh, I wanted to get out of the cruiser as fast as possible you know because the uh, male presenting a weapon was an immediate threat to myself and my partner so um, Loman is going into far too much detail and using very clinical language either he is trying to present himself as professional or he is emotionally distancing himself from his actions. Referring to Rice as the male allows him to pretend that he wasn't a child. I, I reacted in such a way that I was, you know, trained, um, you know, in, in defense, firing two shots and, um, you know, rendering the suspect, uh, you know, down. Okay. When you did fire your weapon, do you know about how far away you were? Um, it was approximately 10 feet, I would say. And at the time you fired your weapon, he was actually, did he actually have the, the gun in hand? 
Yes, it, it, it was like uh, like partially in his waistband. You know, he lifted, present, lift up his shirt and like present like a clear, you know, cut image that his hand was going down into his waistband and he was pulling upward, you know, the weapon. Did he say anything to you or your partner at any time? He did not. Um, he, he, all he did was, you know, he lifted up his shirt and that way we could see that there was no, like the gun was out of his waistband and that uh, he, he was shot in the upper abdomen and he kind of pretty much just moaned, you know, he, he didn't say anything to me at least. Um, my partner mostly was the one uh, tending, you know, to the uh, suspect and I was um, observing the scene, you know, uh, all around for other threats. Do you recall when you guys were pulling up that your partner was telling you that he was getting ready to run? Um, I can't say um, I recall that, but just the the boy's um, actions, you know, he when he grabbed the gun, put it in his waistband, he was walking away from our zone car, and it looked like he, it did appear that he was going to run. Okay. Well, during that time, you're giving commands to this man. Yes, that is correct. His hands. Yes, let me see your hands. And at that time, like, my focus was on his hands and the area where he shoved the gun, which was his waistband. Um, so, like I said, it, it, you know, we, and he matched the perfect description that as radio gave it, to us, so you know, we had every reason to believe that this was the black male that we were looking for, and like, and even addition to, you know, additionally, we saw uh, like I witnessed him take the gun, show it in his waistband, and you know, proceed to walk away. All right. At some point, right after the incident, did um, somebody confiscate your weapon from you? Sergeant Rutherford did. Uh, she took my weapon, and then when I was being treated uh, by uh, EMS, uh, Deputy Chief Tomba took my two magazines. When you handed your weapon over to Sergeant Rutherford, was it in the same condition after shooting? Yes, it was. Yes. Did you take your magazine out? And no, I, I did not reload a magazine. I uh, uh, just returned it back to my holster once the, the, the threat was uh, clear. Okay. And you said you gave your two spare magazines to Commander? Uh, Deputy Chief Tom. Okay. And what, uh, your left ankle was injured? Yes, my left ankle was injured. I was treated uh, by EMS and uh, I could hardly walk on it. I, I had to, you know, um, be assisted, you know, by other officers. Um, and I was uh, sent to Fairview Hospital um, where they took x-rays. What's and, wrong with it? Um, they they said um, there was it appeared that there was no fractures, but it was a severe sprain. Um, it was swollen. My like immediately after like it was probably like almost ten minutes. I would say almost ten minutes after I removed my shoe and sock, and my ankle was swollen, you know, to about the size of a tennis ball. Somebody did come out and photograph you that night. Uh, yes, uh, they did. Uh, at the hospital, they photographed my ankle. And uh, now the current state of my ankle is it's really bruised now. It, it, it almost looks like I'm wearing a black sock. Uh, the swelling has gone down now, but my, my, the bruising is, is worse. Any other injuries? No, that was the only injury was my left ankle. Did you have any exposure to blood? Um, no, sir. At any time, did you hear your partner fire his weapon? He did not. <clears throat> what time of day does this take place? This took place at um, 3.30 uh, was 3.30 p.m. is when we got the call, so it's daylight hours. Um, we arrived Shortly afterward, it only took us approximately two minutes to get down to that area. Um, what were the conditions outside today? Um, it was, um, I would say, partly cloudy, um, but daylight. So I, that's how you could view the weapon so well and the subject, and you know, uh, the, you know. It had snowed the night before. Yes. Yeah, so there was snow on the ground, and uh, the weather conditions are important.
since much of Loman's testimony revolves around Rice's visibility and what Loman could reasonably see. We were in a park with trees, so there was leaves on the ground and grass. So, like I said, it was difficult probably for Frank to maneuver the zone car. And also, like I said, uh, for, my, for me trying to, uh, you know, get out of the line of fire, you know, if, if the uh, black male did, you know, return fire, you know, I slipped and twisted my ankle and fell, you know, because of the conditions. When you did fire your weapon, were you actually outside the vehicle? I was, I had the doorway, uh, the door propped open, and I probably was in almost like a halfway crouched manner. I wasn't like fully standing up, I would say. Like, you could, could you stand up? Like, I was probably like about ankle. like this, okay. and I had, I, I believe I shot just with one hand. So Not this would be, this would be the door? Door. This would this be the door. Because door, right. you're the passenger. Right. So right, I am the passenger. This was the car, the seat that you would have been in. Yes, and you're out of the door now. Yeah, I'm. I'm like in the doorway, you know, and the subject's about, you know, right, right where he is, a little bit farther. And I fired two shots, and then, like I said, I tried to go to the rear of the zone car for cover. So I, I probably, you know, I was not standing fully up and like full presentation like this. I was, you know. I, it, it was that quick where the black male turned, lifted up his shirt, grabbed, you know, reached in his waistband, pulled up the weapon, and that's, you know, at that time I was probably about like this, and that's when I had to fire two shots and attempt to gain cover. Let me, let me, when you're still up. Sure. When, when, relax for a second. Okay. Uh, when, when you see him at the, at the picnic table, mm -hmm. okay, he made motions before with, with the gun being down and with his right hand, he took something off the table. Yes, which you, the gun. Was the gun. Yes. Okay. And then he, when he puts it back in his waistband, waistband. Said, is he standing at that point? Yeah, he, he is standing. He, he stood first, I believe, to create room to place it in his waistband, I believe. And then he proceeded to walk away. Like he was still under the gazebo, okay. walking away. Which by would the be towards North towards North? towards yes towards the uh, the recreation center. Okay, and at that point, what do you think is happening? I like it. And we, I thought that he was going to take off, and I believe my partner thought the same thing. When you say That's take off, what do you mean? Like running, like he was going to run. Okay. Um, and you know, try to elude us. Um, and. That's why, like our cruiser, we continued, you know, to approach the male because his back was turned to us, and it, it you know, he took a few. He was walking away from the cruiser towards the wreck zone, so it, it did seem like he was going to, you know, you know, run from us, run away. Okay. Did you make a comment at all? Do you do you say he's going to go? He's going to run? No, I, I believe like there was no communication between Frank and I because I was yelling. The whole time, let me but, see your hands. But there was communication with you prior to you coming down 100th Street. Yes, yes, that discuss was discussed how we were going to approach the scene. That was en route, like before we hit the park. Okay, so now you're back at the, you're coming through the park. Mm -hmm. He stood up, he put the gun, which he showed us in his waistband. Yes, in his waistband. Great room, yeah. and you think he's going northbound. Yes, towards the rec center. All right, and then at that point he turns back to come westbound? Turns uh, towards he, 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 Yes, he faces like to probably check to see where we were mm -hmm. um you know and he turned and faced our zone car like you said westbound and that's when he began you know like when he saw that we were like behind him like you know approaching him, that we you know he that's when he pulled okay. up his shirt and reached up you there okay uh you made a comment before that uh you, you went through some ruts or something like that what did uh, oh like I, I was saying that like saying that we could like it, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I believe we did slide a bit. I believe Frank tried to stop did the, you car. Feel the car. Pulsating? No, I did not. I was focused on the subject's hands and his waistline because I knew there was, you know, a gun involved. Mm -hmm. When do you think that you opened up the door and presented your weapon? How far uh, away were you from the guy at that point? Uh, like I said, about 10 feet. Because at that time, the the subject had already like turned around. And faced our zone car. So you don't open up the door. I if the door's already open, like it's slightly ajar because I opened it to yell commands, like the verbal commands from 
the start when we I saw him take the gun and put it in his waistband. So all I had all I had to do was push it open. Okay. And how far away were you at that point where you opened up the door to yell commands? When I in, initially yelled commands, yes. or from when we were when, when we you, were right next. You made a comment that you opened up the door to yell commands when you saw the gun on the table and you started putting it in his waist. Mm -hmm. How far away were you at that point? Um, I would say. 20, between 20 and 30 yards at, at, at least you know I like could be wrong but I would say uh, 23 yards. but I you know I was screaming in a loud manner so it could be heard and like I said I presented my weapon you know so it could be seen through the window to know that you know this was an emergency incident and that you know this was not a joke and that you know okay. that there was a severe threat for purposes of the video, yes, you are the passenger officer. I am. You are traveling, which would be northbound. Yes, towards the And Brisbane. so you would have your your right handed. Yes, I am right handed. So your weapon's out, and you would have to reach a little bit across with your body to open up the door. Yeah, to open up the door. At, at that point, I was probably seated. You know, this is like the cruiser car. I was mm -hmm. probably seated like this. Okay. You know, get ready. I was ready. You know, to for. Given the grainy nature of the video as well as the lack of sound and poor angle. It can't be said for certain exactly what Loman was seeing at all times. There has never been any indication that Rice said anything at all, including information about his age or that he was only holding a toy. However, at his age and in that situation, it is completely understandable that he might have been too frightened to speak at all. You know, any type of action, like if he took off running, you know, to, you know, you know, get out of the cruiser, or if, or if he did turn around and fire, that I would be ready to react to that. Okay. You know, so I, I was, you know, preparing myself. You know, as you know, Frank, as my train officer, he told me to be prepared for anything. And the 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 elevation, you know, the the le the level that we were at, you know, it it got higher and higher and higher just because, you know, first you see him, you know, the male matching description, but then you see the gun. And then now he's, you know, walking away and now, you know, he's presenting the gun, you know, it, it, he's pulling out his waistband. So your, your levels were getting higher and higher and higher uh, and, and the threat just became incredible where, you know, I had to, you know, make the decision fast because Frank and I were in immediate danger. Um, you know, if the subject did pull out the gun and uh, like present it and, you know, point it towards us. I would have been shot, and possibly my friend, uh, my partner would have been shot, especially due to the close proximity that we we were at. It, it, you know, we were easy targets, and plus, I was stuck in the doorway, and my partner was still seated in the driver's seat. So we were basically sitting ducks. Okay, you made a comment just there that if he pointed a gun at you, you would have been shot. Yes. Did it, did it get that far? He did not. He the the farthest he got was raising it to about his abdomen abdomen level okay. he he did not punch out or present it because at that at, when he got about this far mm -hmm. that's when i shot why because the, i believe there was a threat to myself and my partner and it was you know in order to kill us or harm us so you thought uh, what i thought i was going to die and why because he had a, a weapon you know that in cl at close proximity and he was going to use it against us because you know to the facts, you know, that the radio gave us that he was pointing a gun at other people and, you know, he, you know, and no doubt in my mind that he was going to, you know, present, like, present to us and, you know, possibly harm us and, or even kill us, you know, there was no doubt in my mind that threat was there and I had to take action to protect the lives of myself and my partner. Right. Let's go back once again to the gun. Sure. All right. You say it's with his right hand? I believe it was with his right hand. One hand had the shirt, okay. and the other w was reaching down in his waistband and pulling up. So you see his hand on the the weapon? Yes, yeah. It, where, it, where at on the weapon? Uh, it, it, like in a grip on the, okay. you know, the grip of the gun. And then can you see the gun coming out? It, it's, yeah, it was, he was pulling it upward okay. towards his abdomen. All right, and at that point is when you're out of the car and you fire two rounds? Two rounds, yes. And why'd you fire two? Um, in, I, I fired two and I also, in, also wanted to get out of the position that I was in mm -hmm. because I was trapped in the doorway. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, if I was fired upon, 
like I couldn't go backwards, I couldn't go left, you know, forward or left because, you know, the door, I was trapped in the door. So I, the only exit option I had was to, you know, retreat to the back of the cruiser. And even that was kind of like a far retreat given the, you know, how close we were to them. But, um, uh, so I, I was able to like lunge over to the area, but like I said, I hurt myself and I, I you know, was able to get behind the cruiser for cover. But at that time, you know, when I stood up, the subject was already on the ground. And what does that mean? If one were to go solely on Lohman's description of events, the impression would be that a reasonable amount of time had passed. Although the video quality is poor, it shows that the whole incident took a matter of seconds. I, I, it, I believe that I did um, hit the subject mm -hmm. and uh, neutralize the threat. So why you didn't shoot anymore? I did not shoot anymore and I could, at that time, I could see his hands. Okay. He was moving his hands. Let me, let me go back yes. to that. When, when, he's, sure. when he's down on the ground, is he face down? No, he was face upward. Uh, uh, like, I, I don't know if he rolled. I don't know how he fell because I was trying to get out of the way. But when I stood up, he was face upward and rolling, you know, motioning and you know moving his hands okay. and the, the threat was still there at the time even though he was on the ground because we, we didn't know like but you didn't see did you see a gun at that point at that point I, I did not have a good view my partner um, but you were able to see his hands. I was able to see his hands so I did not fire again why did you fire again because there was no gun in his hand there was no weapon in his hand at the time uh, but then you know my partner was on the other side of the zone car the front of the zone car and he he had a, a better view and saw that the gun had, you know, fallen from his grip, like next to him, a couple feet next to him. And, you know, when the uh, male st stopped moving, my partner, you know, he had his gun present and he approached and he kicked the gun to the side. Okay. Your gun was still out too? During my gun was still out. And you had the, the suspect covered? The suspect was covered, yes, okay. yes. All right. Do you see the gun on the, on the ground? When my partner kicked it away, yes. Okay. You made a comment earlier, too, uh, something about it being a 1911 Colt. How did you know that? Um, I, um, I'm a gun collector. I have multiple guns at home. I, you know, I read on weapons. Uh, I follow history. You know, I, I, you know, I can identify guns, you know, fairly easily. I, you know, read magazines. You know, I, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm a hunter, so I'm well-rounded with weapons. I, you know can recognize weapons and to me it looked like you know like a military issued Colt 1911 model gun which is a larger 45 caliber uh, weapon and with your experience of, of guns and collecting and reading everything mm -hmm. what did that gun look like to you it looked it, it looked um, like a Colt 1911 model 45 caliber a, a BB gun no it did not look like a BB gun it was a gun. It, it was mind. yes. It was a gun. Okay. The, the at the the time I noticed that it was a BB gun is when Frank kicked it over and the magazine fell out. And when I did move myself from the back of the zone car to approach, you know, the victim and where the gun was, then I noticed um, the magazine did not contain 45 caliber rounds. It it, it uh, appeared that it would be more suitable to contain uh, like BBs. Okay. Uh, at any point did you have any contact with the suspect? Did you put your hands on him? <coughs> did you cuff him? I did not. I did not put any hands on the suspect. Um, my partner did. Um, he, he was the one that tended the suspect. Okay. Like I said, I was I was um, the one making sure the scene was safe 360 because there could have been possible other threats coming from the uh, rec center. Which my the first person I saw was the black female that was running towards us, and that's when I had to uh, act and restrain her. Okay, did you uh, handcuff <coughs> the person you shot? I did not handcuff. Was, do you know if he was ever handcuffed? I would. I think he was not. Um, he yeah. He was not. He was still moving his hands. He was not cuffed, and um, the gun was away. So it, I believe it was uh, safe enough where we could treat, uh, tend to the the, the subject. To his, uh, okay. 
country. Do you recall seeing anyone else out there with him when you were pulling up? No, he was sitting by himself. Do you recall he, seeing anyone else in the park? There was not any, not anyone else around in the park. It was just him at the gazebo sitting by himself on the picnic table. There was no one else, you know, in the vicinity at all. And it, it took about, it was probably about two minutes later um, when I saw the black female running from the rec center and then there was po like approximately three males standing by the rec center door and then another police officer came out, out of the rec center and assisted with the um, black female that was running on scene. I want to clarify one thing. Uh, Detective Diaz asked you if this uh, person made any comments to you. And you said that when he was on the ground after he was shot that he was moaning. And yeah, he, that prior prior to that, mm -hmm. when he's uh, making the motion uh, to, to get the gun mm -hmm. out of his waistband, mm -hmm. is he making any comments to you? Is no, he, he did not. He did not say any words. Right. The only thing that was being said where you were showing, saying, "Show me your hands." Yes. Three, stop. Yes, correct. Okay. All right. The information that you had mm -hmm. coming to that scene was what. The information di dispatched by dispatchers uh, when we initially got was a black male wearing a camouflage hat in a gray like sweater with black sleeves. Um, that was it. That it was, um, and, it, and it said the male had a gun and was pointing it at you know passerbys in the park, okay. and he was in the park area, uh, like by the like the swing set area. Did they give you an, uh, an age, approximate age? No, there was no age given. It was a black male. That Any was other it. mention of the weapon, what kind it was? No, there was no mention of what kind of weapon um, or size or anything. It was just a black male with a weapon. Surprisingly, Loman isn't lying. The original caller said that Rice was probably a minor and that he was most likely holding a toy. The dispatcher did not pass along either of these crucial details. Physical? Did he give you a physical description other than the clothing description? No, it was just a clothing description. That was it. No height or weight? No height or weight, no. Uh, you went to the hospital? I did. All right. Uh, you were transported by EMS? Yes, I was. Okay. Cleveland EMS. And you were on scene for how long before they transported you? Um, I would say approximately... I would say about 20 minutes. I am not sure because uh, I at first I was told to sit down, um, get off my leg because I was injured. Did I could you, hardly did you stand. Get separated from your partner. I, I was separated from my partner. Um, I would like uh, upon when uh, when other officers, Cleveland police officers, uh, were on scene to you know I I saw um, officers begin to tape off the scene and um, the. A, a, a big black male was coming from the fire station area and he he was um, posturing like he was gonna pump me and he was yelling like you know fuck the police and you know you shot my brother and uh, you know at that time I, I figured that you know was his brother and the police um, uh, he was posturing to like hit a police officer but the police placed his arms around him and they cuffed him and took him off did you have any contact with him? No, I did not. I did not. Okay. And you were seated. <coughs> I was point. seated. I was uh, at that time. I was standing outside a cruiser, like probably resting my hand, like keeping my weight off my ankle. Okay. And then I then I did sit down in another cruiser. It was probably the cru I, it was the cruiser that was like I would say closest to our zone car. Probably the second. I'm not sure, but probably the second responders uh, from our department's cruiser. And I sat in the front passenger seat, and at that time I was approached by, uh, later was approached by Sergeant Rutherford, where she, you know, checked on me, made sure I was okay, and then I gave her my firearm. Okay, so you did not have a chance to talk to Officer Garn uh, back? I did not, no. Okay. No. Uh, since this event, have you had an opportunity to talk to him? Um, when we returned to the district, um, I, uh, Officer Garn back and I were separated for hours. Because I was being treated at the hospital okay, and he's dancing. On that point, you said you were at the scene for a good 20 minutes? I would say at least 20 minutes. Okay, and then you were transported to what hospital? Uh, Fairview Hospital. And I was in the back of the ambulance for a long time, and that's when um, uh, other members of the police department came to talk to me. Um, 
that's when Deputy Chief Tomba took my two magazines along. I believe he was with um, Commander McCartney. Um, Steve was uh, one who showed up. Did anybody from uh, the use of deadly force team talk to you at that point? No, no one talked to me at that point. It what was just actually, EMS personnel. No, uh, were you actually interviewed by the use of deadly force? I was interviewed by them at the hospital. Uh, Tucker, you, you were the first to show up. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, Andre Sisko showed up from uh, um, uh, the what employee assistance unit. And um, Jeff Fulmer showed up. Um, and then Detective Diaz showed up. And that's when... We uh, we had a discussion of the events at took place. Had you talked to your partner prior to that? Uh, I did not. Okay. So when you I interviewed you, you hadn't talked to. I had not. Partner. No, he was still on scene, and I was being treated at the hospital. The only officer that was with me was Luke Kitko, who who assisted me in walking, and you know was presiding over me because I did not have my weapon at the time, um, and. He, Luke Kikko presided over me, and he did very good At what good point job. did you get your secondary weapon today? Was it replaced? Um, in, the in the hospital, uh, hours later, uh, one of the detectives from the hospital, or the homicide unit, um, returned. I, I don't know his name. I see him here today. but uh, He returned uh, me a duty weapon and my magazines. Okay. Uh, what ankle did you injure? I injured my left ankle. Okay, when you left the hospital that night, uh, were you able to walk on your own, or did you? Uh, have I was not. I they um, they gave me Motrin, a prescription for Percocet. They wrapped my ankle and they gave me a uh, air cast and a, a set of crutches. So I uh, was using the crutches and um, also Officer Kitko, you know, assisted me with uh, you know getting in the cruiser and okay. you know. Can you give me uh, about how long you were at the hospital? At, I would say at least two hours. Okay. Uh, were you able to come back to the scene and assist us with a walkthrough? I was not able to come back to see my ankle was, um, you know, injured to the point where I could not stand on my own. And uh, I, you know. Loman did not interact with anyone else once he fired his two shots. Whether this was a choice or a result of his injury is impossible to say. Was in pain. Was um, being treated. Right? I was being treated also. So I did not return to the scene that night at all. Okay. Uh, based on that, we would like to see if we get a medical release for your medical records for that day for that treat. Certainly. Okay. Uh, and we'll discuss no, that. Sure. All right. We'll discuss that. Uh, since this time, after you were interviewed, you gave your initial verbal statement to Detective mm -hmm. Diaz. Mm -hmm. Did you have conversations with uh, your your partner? Um, the only. Um, conversation that I've had with my partner was after I was released from the hospital and after he left the scene we were reunited um, he, he picked me up from the hospital and took me a district um, we may have briefly talked about um, the incident but um, mostly we were working on paperwork um, completing our duty and I also had like paperwork from the hospital and uh, you know, we had, you know, a report, you know, just general paperwork to take. So you didn't rehearse your stories or anything? Um, not, n not really. I, I mean, we talked probably briefly about it, you know, just making sure we're okay. So what you told Detective Diaz that night, what you told us tonight is what happened? Yes, that is what happened. Okay. Uh, I have one other question. I forgot what it was. You remember? Oh. You said that uh, you hit the streets uh, out of the police academy, Cleveland Police Academy, on uh, August 28th. Yes. That what was, was your appointment date to our department? Um, it was March 3rd, 2014. That's when I was appointed to the academy. That was our first day of the academy. An academy is approximately six months long. And then we are sworn in and uh, detailed 
to a district to continue our training. Okay. Prior to coming uh, to the Cleveland Police Department, do you have any prior experience with law enforcement? Um, I was sworn in by the Independence Police Department, and I attended the Cleveland Heights Police Academy, um, but I resigned um, in the early stages of my training with the Independence Police Department. So I, my, my, I've been trained, but I would say my experience on the street is almost to none, you know. Is what you've gotten through us. Is what Cleveland. is, my experience on the street is all through Cleveland. Okay. When did you go through Cleveland Heights um, Academy? I started the Cleveland Heights Police Academy July 11th of 2012. And when did you resign from them? I resigned from the Independence Police Department December 5th of 2012. And why was that? Uh, personal reasons I resigned for. Okay. Did you know that you were uh, going to get hired by Cleveland at that time? I did not, but I was pursuing um, to go to another department. Um, I, at shortly afterward, I was, um, I, I was on lists of other police departments and was can, pursuing to take tests for other police departments, okay. preferably bigger police departments. Okay. Any uh, military? I do not have any military experience. I'm a college graduate. Okay. Where'd you go? I went to Cleveland State University where I obtained my bachelor's degree in criminology and sociology. Okay. And I also have an um, associate's degree from Cuyahoga Community College in law enforcement. All right. uh, I think you went to get the medical release and we'll ask uh, at this point I'm sorry, do you have any other questions? No, no. We'd like to take a, a formal written statement from that. A waiver written statement, rely on the uh, video. Okay, all right. Uh, any questions? Any None concerns? by me. Steve? Any questions? I do not. Uh, Officer Loman, is, is there something that we missed, something that we need to know, anything? Um, like not at this time. Uh, what I present is uh, the events that happened uh, on that day. Okay. Uh, this is uh, a Garrity form, uh, which we talked about at the beginning. I'm sure uh, Attorney Heigl here will talk to you about it, so we'll let you guys sign your need to. Okay. So, okay. Okay. This one, we should get your name on it. I did. You like Master Down? All right. Oh. The initial interview is over although there are sure to be more questions for Loman as the investigation progresses. I'm going to uh, end the tape right now because all we need is the medical release, all right? It's getting hot in here. Oh, you want to appreciate this? The top. Rice lay on the ground for nearly four minutes before aid was administered. His wounds were more complicated than what the officers on the scene had been trained to deal with. He was transported to the hospital, where he died the next day from injuries to major vessels, intestines, and the pelvis. After a lengthy investigation in June 2015, it was concluded that Loman's actions were responsible under the circumstances. This sparked an outcry from Rice's family, community, and the country as a whole. It wasn't until December 29, 2020, that the United States Department of Justice decided not to indict Lohman. Although his actions were condemned, there was not enough evidence to charge him with a crime. Rice's family filed a lawsuit against Lohman and the city, and eventually a settlement was made for $6 million. 
In 2017, Timothy Lohman was fired for concealing details about his past employment and his job application. On October 5, 2018, the city of Bel Air, Ohio, hired Lohman as a part-time officer. Five days later, Lohman withdrew his application. In 2022, Lohman became the only policeman in the small department of Tioga Borough, Pennsylvania. He resigned after less than a week. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, there is a Patreon link in the description where you can support the channel further. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.